The Ruins of Jerusalem, Sometime After the Quitos War Three rabbis make a pilgrimage to the abandoned city, rending their garments as they take in the view from atop Mount Scopus. Reaching the Temple Mount, they see a fox emerge from the hollow in the foundation stone. Two of the rabbis fall to their knees and weep, but the third laughs. Why are you laughing? the other rabbis ask. That is the Holy of Holies, reserved only for the high priest. Not even we can breach its premises, and yet now even the animals violate it. The third rabbi cautions them. In the time of the prophet Isaiah, he says, the high priest Uriah prophesied that Jerusalem would become rubble, and that the Temple Mount would become like a mountain in a forest, a place where foxes lie. So if the prophecy of the foxes has come true, so too must their prophecies of a messiah and a rebuilt temple. That rabbi's name is Akiva ben Joseph, and he believes he has found that messiah. During the Quitos War, Emperor Trajan had died and had been succeeded by his cousin and general Hadrian. Early in his reign, Hadrian pursued a pragmatic policy of mitigating conflict within the empire, first withdrawing from Mesopotamia in order to make peace with Parthia, and famously building a wall across northern Britain in order to demarcate that Rome would no longer intend to conquer the whole island. In response to the massive Jewish revolts in the east, Hadrian forcibly repatriated hundreds of thousands of Jews from Cyprus and Cyrenaica back to Judea and placated them by announcing that Jerusalem and the Jewish temple would be rebuilt. But by the time Reconstruction began in 130, Hadrian's outlook had fundamentally changed. In the final years of his life, Flavius Josephus had published a fiery polemic condemning Appion, an Egyptian historian who had written during the reigns of Tiberius and Caligula. Among Appion's works was apparently a frothing screed which excoriated the Jews as a barbaric horde, incapable of greatness, whose entire history was an elaborate fabrication. It is ironic, and perhaps just, that Appion's work against the Jews has been lost while Josephus's condemnation of it has survived. But at least one of Appion's conspiracy theories has lived on. The blood libel. In his now lost work, Appion claimed that Jews annually sacrificed and ate Greek captives in the temple. He alleged that this had been secret knowledge for centuries, and based it on the grounds that Jews were circumcised, which the Greeks saw as an abhorrent betrayal of the physically perfect male body, that Jewish places of worship were enclosed rather than open air, and nothing good can happen behind closed doors, and that the Jewish god had no physical form, which is just innately terrifying. Appion had been dead for nearly a century by this point, but his influence was particularly profound on Rome's newest popular historian, Cornelius Tacitus. But whereas Appion regarded the Jews as an ineffectual rabble, Tacitus believed them to be an eternal existential threat to Greco-Roman civilization. The Jews regard as profane all that we hold sacred. On the other hand, they permit all that we abhor. The other customs of the Jews are base and abominable, and owe their persistence to their depravity. The Jews are extremely loyal toward one another, and always ready to show compassion, but toward every other people they feel only hate and enmity. Although as a race they are prone to lust, they abstain from intercourse with foreign women, yet among themselves nothing is unlawful. They believe that the souls of those who are killed in battle or by the executioner are immortal, hence comes their passion for begetting children and their scorn of death. Tacitus died in 120, but his work was celebrated by Hadrian whose like-minded love of all things Greek led him to reconsider his plans for Jerusalem. And in 132, the city was rebuilt in his own image. Ilia Capitolina had no walls. It was renamed after Hadrian's clan Elias, as well as the god Jupiter Capitolinus, for whom he built a temple on the site of the Jewish temple. In front of its entrance was built a massive column, topped with a bronze statue of himself. At the entrance to the Temple Mount was a triumphal arch dedicated to Lucius Flavius Silva, who had taken the lost Jewish stronghold at Masada. And in his hatred for the Christians, Hadrian had commissioned a temple to Venus over the hill of Golgotha. 
This meant war. Around the same time, Rabbi Akiva ben Joseph spoke up. Old enough to remember the first Jewish-Roman war, Akiva was the chief rabbi of Bnei Brak. It was only a small village about halfway between Jaffa and Lydda, but Akiva had come to prominence decades earlier when he toured Jewish communities all over the Roman Empire. And as Hadrian's true intentions on Jerusalem became clear, Akiva wrote to these communities, proclaiming that he had found the Messiah in a man named Simon bar Kosiba. In tribute to the passage in Numbers that says, There shall come a star out of Jacob. Bar Kosiba took on the name Bar Kochba, son of the star. But not all were convinced. Said Rabbi John ben Torta to Akiva, Grass will grow from your cheeks, and still the son of David will not come. And this is where things get kind of fuzzy. We don't have a Josephus to guide us here. The best sources we have to go by are the Mishnah, which is a legal casebook and not a history, a collection of Bar Kochba's personal correspondence, which were discovered near the Dead Sea in the 1950s and lack any valuable context, and some 600 words by the Roman historian Cassius Dio, who was born 19 years after the war ended. So if my telling of the war comes off as a drive-by description of battles and units like that one John Green video, that's really all we have. For as much as we know about Rabbi Akiva, we know almost nothing about Bar Kochba. Not where he came from, not how old he was, not what he did before the revolt, not even how he was ultimately able to rally Judea to his cause. But he had studied the first Jewish war and analyzed its failures. He had also studied the Maccabean revolt, and his strategy closely emulated that of the Maccabees, but on a massive scale. First, Jewish forces from Edom to the Galilee would engage in an extensive guerrilla campaign, luring Roman legions deep into hostile territory to quell what appeared to be a small rebellion before overwhelming them with superior numbers. To enable fast communication between rebel cells, Bar Kochba's quartermaster general, Joshua ben Galgula, transformed at least 350 small caves throughout the country into sophisticated hideouts. Cassius Dio reports that Bar Kochba's forces were joined by many outside nations, it is unclear whether he means other ethnic minorities or fellow Jews from outside the empire, but the latter is probable and we know the former to be certain. Bar Kochba's forces included large numbers of Samaritans, who had previously sat out the Jewish-Roman conflicts. Furthermore, much of Bar Kochba's personal correspondence was written in Greek, suggesting the participation of groups from Asia Minor who did not speak Aramaic. Bar Kochba's force also likely included 24,000 rabbinical students loyal to Rabbi Akiva. However, Akiva himself would not live to participate in the Great War. As the revolt began in 132, he was captured by the Romans and flayed alive with iron combs. Around the same time, Bar Kochba's uncle, Eleazar of Modiim, launched hostilities. Within weeks, all of Bar Kochba's forces were activated and the guerrilla war had begun. With the outbreak of the revolt, the 10th Fratensis found itself surrounded, and its commander, former consul Quintus Tinius Rufus, was probably killed in battle as the rebels flooded through the unwalled streets of Elia. The 6th Ferrata was sent to relieve the city, but Jewish forces held them off at Shechem, forcing the Romans to flee the former Jerusalem. Although Bar Kochba did not move his headquarters to the former capital, he did begin minting coins celebrating the inevitable reconsecration of the temple. The Romans persisted. Toward the end of the year, governors of all Judea's neighboring provinces had dispatched an additional four legions. But by this point, the Judean army was large enough to engage the Romans in open combat and keep the legions from penetrating the rough terrain of the Judean hills. One legion, the 22nd Deuteriana, was probably completely wiped out, a defeat so humiliating that the Roman Senate unsuccessfully attempted to erase the 22nd's existence from the public record, though their effort was successful enough that we can't know for sure. Toward the end of 133, the Romans managed to cut off Jewish supply lines out of the country, forcing the Jews to retreat to the cities and prepare for a series of sieges. Former consul Sextus Julius Severus was recalled from Britain to lead an additional three legions from Europe. Yet again, the Jews managed to wipe out one of them, the Ninth Hispana. Whenever Roman emperors went on campaign, it was customary to report to the Senate, If you and your children are in health, it is well. I and the army are in health. Hadrian, upon his arrival in Judea, reported, I am in health. 
But the end was coming. By this time, a full third of the Roman army was in Judea. In early 135, the Romans took the Herodium, the mausoleum of King Herod, and operational headquarters of Joshua ben Galgula. At this point, Bar Kokhba's de facto Jewish state collapsed. Jerusalem was abandoned, Jewish forces scattered, and what remained fell back with Bar Kokhba to the fortress of Betau, high above the Sorek River. As the legions approached, Bar Kokhba fell into a paranoid depression and had Eleazar executed for treason on no evidence. For this, the Sanhedrin determined that Bar Kokhba had lost God's mandate and so redubbed him Bar Koziba, son of the lie. It would appear that only two legions came to take Betau, but the siege was not prolonged. The boys in the town's yeshiva were instructed that they should take their quills and poke out the Roman soldiers' eyes should the city fall. But it likely never came to that. Betau was a bloodbath. The fortress fell on Tisha B'Av, the 65th anniversary of the destruction of the temple. The Talmud says that blood ran through the citadel up to the nostrils of the Roman horses, and while that is poetic hyperbole, it is notable that Betar had any Jewish survivors at all. Bar Kochba was not one of them. There are wildly conflicting accounts of his death, even within the Babylonian Talmud. One account says he was executed by the Sanhedrin as a false messiah, but the Sanhedrin was on the wrong side of the Roman line, and by this point its various members had gone into hiding. More likely to me is the account that Bar Kochba was bitten by a venomous snake, that his body was found after the battle, and that his head was removed and delivered to Emperor Hadrian. Hadrian even prohibited the burial of Betau's dead, leaving the bodies to languish and decompose under the August sun. However, what happened in the wake of the Bar Kokhba revolt was ultimately far more destructive and devastating to Jewish history than even the fall of Jerusalem so many decades earlier. Fifty fortified towns and 985 villages were burned to the ground, and with them, their citizens. Altogether, 580,000 Jews died in the Bar Kokhba revolt, mostly unarmed civilians, making this the bloodiest of all the Jewish-Roman wars, and the first of the four major genocides against the Jewish people. Cassius Dio additionally estimates that as many Jews died from disease and famine caused by the war as died by the sword, pushing the death toll over a million. This estimate is largely confirmed in the historical record by Roman census data from the time. With the old Judean countryside thoroughly depopulated, Hadrian took something else from the land, its name. Judea instead became Palestine spitefully given in honor of King David's ancient and notably Hellenic enemy. This name was rejected by Jewish scribes, who subsequently referred to the historic region as the Land of Israel. The province itself was then merged with Syria to form Syria-Palestina. Hadrian's fury against the Jews did not stop there. The only solution he saw to the Jewish problem was to eradicate Judaism itself. The Great Sanhedrin was dissolved. Its seven highest-ranking members were given tortuous executions in the style of Rabbi Akiva. They, along with Simon ben Gamliel and Ishmael HaKohen, who had been executed after the First Jewish-Roman War, are known collectively as the Ten Martyrs. Anyone of Jewish descent was banned from setting foot in Elia Capitolina. Circumcision was outlawed. Celebrating Jewish holidays became a crime. To kill the Jewish tradition, it seemed, would be Hadrian's legacy. And then, just two years later, he died. As it turned out, not only had the emperor been in declining health for years, but he had long earned the hatred of the Senate, who promptly celebrated his demise. Hadrian's successor, Antoninus Pius, ultimately prevented the Senate from officially proclaiming Hadrian a tyrant, but he did immediately repeal most of the laws passed by Hadrian including almost all of Hadrian's edicts against the Jews. He even allowed the dead of Betau to be buried, and on the same day celebrated Tubav, the festival of grapes and romance, with the Jews of Rome, demonstrating to the empire that they were under his protection. Although Antoninus Pius is the rare Roman emperor celebrated by Judaism, his reversal of Hadrian's policies was not total. It couldn't be. 
Over a million Jews were dead, and the Judean mountains had never been more desolate. The princess Julia Crispina was also dead, and without her protection, Jewish-held lands in Palestine were confiscated by Roman landlords, who defied Jewish law by stripping the fallow land, commencing centuries of catastrophic deforestation from which the region has only recently begun to recover. Most visibly, Jerusalem remained Elia Capitolina. The Temple of Jupiter continued to stand atop the Temple Mount. The Colossus of Hadrian, now joined by one of Antoninus. Jews continued to be banned from the city except to commemorate its destruction on Tisha B'Av, and so it would remain for centuries. But, as we shall soon see, survival is sometimes enough to celebrate. Special thanks to my patrons, including Geonim level patrons Lev Cham and Vicky Nelson. If you like this and want to support the channel, you too can become a patron on Patreon, linked in the description below. You can also find links to my sources for this video in the description, as well as a link to my book, An Armada of Cats, Travels in Israel. Otherwise, you can always like, share, and subscribe. I will see you next time.